And now I'd like to welcome Susan Goldberg. Susan is the editorial director of National Geographic Partners and the editor-in-chief of the magazine. Susan has been a true pioneer in the space as a woman in the field of journalism. Um, and Susan, alongside so many at National Geographic, have helped us develop very strong partnerships with the magazine and the news division on dozens of projects over the years. So please join me in welcoming Susan. Well, thank you very much, Natalie, and uh, good evening, everybody. Uh, you know, at National Geographic, we have a saying, and it's that we believe in the power of science, exploration, and storytelling to change the world. And we do that, all, we, I feel like we do that every day. We have great opportunities every month in our magazine, but every day spread across all of our digital platforms. And over and over again, we've had the opportunity to make a difference because of the partnerships that we've had with the Pulitzer Center. We've actually had more than 70 major stories that we've partnered with them on. And one of the biggest stories that we've worked on with them have been stories that involve gender. On the screen, you see a story that we did that uh, girls, um, Girl Be Heard referenced. It was a story about widowhood around the world. You know, every year, 800,000 American women become widows. And for those of us who have actually been widows, this has been, a, it was a searing, terrible experience. But the truth is, is that we were the lucky ones because in many parts of the world, losing one's husband isn't just about the death of your spouse. In these places, widowhood plays out as a dire example of gender inequality where the husband's death becomes the death of the woman as well. And women in these places enter a state of widowhood that they either cannot for legal reasons or will not for cultural and social reasons ever leave. They're cast out, their possessions can be taken from them, their land can be taken from them, even their children can be taken from them. So we've been working with photographer Amy Tunzing, who had a grant from the Pulitzer Center. She has worked on the story of widows for more than 10 years. And she first traveled to India to document the story of widows in, tw in 2005. Then last year, we sent back Amy and a writer named Cynthia Gorney. She went back to India and then two very different parts of the world. They went to Bosnia and Uganda to continue the project. And they went not to explore the private grieving of these women, but as Cynthia wrote, the way that societies can force a jarring new identity on a woman whose husband has died. Pariah, exile, nuisance, martyr, and prey. Definitely, Cynthia and Amy found that story. But they also found women of incredible strength and resilience who are fighting generations of repressive traditions. These women are making change and sometimes taking charge. In Uganda, for example, Claire Tumashabe, her, his, Claire Tumashabe's husband died and his relatives informed her that her six children now belonged to them, that she was no longer allowed to eat the crops she grew on her land, and that she would become the third wife of her husband's oldest brother. To summarize her answer, no way. She then worked with a lawyer and a US-based nonprofit called International Justice Mission to make sure that Uganda's laws, which are actually some of the strongest laws and, and prohibit exactly this behavior, were enforced. It was a long battle, it was an ugly battle, but today Claire has her children, her home, and she isn't anybody's enforced wife. In fact, one of the men who threatened her went to jail. I believe there's hope, one of the caseworkers who worked with Claire said, we are not 100% there, but we've, become, but we've begun the work. So I think that on behalf of the 245 million widows around the world, these are heartening words indeed. And for this kind of story and shining a light on this situation, we can thank our partnership with the Pulitzer Center. 
Now I'd like to tell you about a different story that we've done in the last year on gender. Uh, in January, we put out an entire issue devoted to the subject of, of gender. Um, I have to tell you, it actually started out uh, as an issue that I wanted to do about the state of women and girls around the world. Uh, then, then a number of my colleagues came to me and said, well, you know, really, the path from boyhood to manhood is increasingly fraught around the world. We should include what's going on with men and boys. And so I thought, okay. Then it became sort of the boy-girl issue. And as we, as we spent a little more time thinking that through, we decided to do something really that nobody has done. And that was look at gender in an inclusive way, to not just look at the binary of gender, but to look at people whose lives are elsewhere on the gender spectrum, somewhere, somewhere else, somewhere along the way. So we looked at gender in, with the biggest possible lens. And in doing this story, we started out by going all over the world. We talked to 89-year-old kids, asking them, what is it like to be a boy in your society? What is it like to be a girl? What if your life was the life of somebody of the other gender, how would it be different? And we got these amazingly <laughs> candid answers, as you might imagine, from these nine-year-olds who, and you know, we talk to nine-year-olds because they're smart and articulate, and nine-year-olds really tell you the truth. <laughs> and so we, we heard incredible things, funny things, sad things, but the thing that broke my heart over and over again in doing this story was that in different languages, using different words, we heard again and again from girls all over the world that gender somehow limited their lives. And that, in 2017, is a tragedy indeed and something that we need to keep shining a light on. But in interviewing these kids, we met Avery Jackson, who you see right here, who's a nine-year-old uh, transgender girl who said an incredible thing to us. She said, the best thing about being a girl is now I don't have to pre pretend to be a boy. <laughs> and we thought that those words were so profound and so powerful that combined with this incredibly amazing photograph taken by uh, Robin Hammond, we decided to put a transgender girl on the cover of National Geographic. So let me tell you, not everybody was happy with this decision. <laughs> um, this, this was uh, kind of, a, it was a historic move. About 8,000 people canceled their subscriptions to National Geographic magazine. The, you know, I, I, I think that people can view these things in different ways and, you know, people can have strongly held feelings and that's fine. The only readers I was really disappointed with were the ones who sent me back the magazine still zipped into the poly bag not even opened, because I felt like if I could have just gotten them to open it, if they could have seen how we really explored the subject of gender through National Geographic's traditional lenses, really, of cultures, of history, of science and photography, then maybe they wouldn't have, have really been so angry. But what was amazing is we had, so we had this group of people who were very angry, but we reached about 400 million people across our social media platforms, one of the largest numbers that we have ever reached for any issue of the magazine. And really, the issue had a lot of impact. It had a lot of impact in the United States, and it had a lot of impact all over the world. And I think we have a slide coming up that will show the covers of all of our international editions and how they handled the gender issue. It was fascinating. We publish in 35 languages, and the vast majority of our foreign publication partners decided to go with gender on the cover. They used different covers. In some cases, they used people in their own communities to illustrate the story. I thought it was absolutely fascinating. So I, I feel like we did a good thing. We made a difference. We had a worldwide impact, but what I am actually the very most proud of are the stories that I heard about how putting Avery Jackson on the cover helped transgendered people feel validated, accepted, and noticed. And I also heard a lot of stories from people about how a traditional 
magazine, a legacy brand like National Geographic, how if we were gonna write a story about gender in an inclusive way, it allowed their families, it gave their families permission, if you will, that was the word I heard over and over again, to have a conversation about what was going on in their own families that they didn't feel like they could have had before. So I, I feel incredibly proud of that and really proud of the work that our staff did to put this story out there. So this is the most important kind of journalism we can do. This is journalism that can make a difference. And I think it does live up to our motto about storytelling that can change the world. So it's stories like widows, stories like gender, we are doing just that. And that brings me again to our partnership with the Pulitzer Center, which shares our values and helps us tell these kinds of critical stories in a way that can reach people all over the world. Thank you so much.